Good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. Uh, welcome to session two of our news literacy webinar series about misinformation and fact checking. Um, we are going to get started here. Um, we have a pretty cool house, so hopefully you'll be able to demonstrate some fact checking skills and we can uh, show you some, some important strategies for how to deal with false information. Um, I'd like to, to acknowledge and, and show our gratitude towards the Four River Foundation, whose generosity has been supporting our efforts uh, for news literacy outreach um, for adults, and in particular for older adults, and have helped us bring this partnership with Senior Planet um, and AARP. My name is John Silva. I am part of the education uh, team at the News Literacy Project. Um, I facilitated the previous session, so if you're new here, this is who I am. Um, my primary focus is on professional learning for educators, um, and my team works to do also develop resources for teaching news literacy. Um, I do spend a good deal of my time um, following things that are happening in misinformation and also with conspiracy theories and the things that are going viral and the things that people are sharing so that I can uh, stay up, on, uh, up to date on things that are happening. I've been with News Literacy Project for um, almost five years. Prior to that, I was a social studies teacher here in Chicago, the Chicago Public Schools. Um, if you would like to reach out to me after today's session, my email address there is at the lower left uh, side of your screen. Um, and you can please feel free to reach out to me directly if there are questions that you have or if you want to follow up afterwards. Um, joining me, uh, you will see her in the chat, and she's going to be helping with the, the Q&A and, and things is my colleague. Elizabeth Price. Um, she is based in California and she works with me in on, on presenting these sessions and doing professional learning. Uh, she's been with NLP for just a few months at this point. She's fairly new. Um, and we were, we we're very thankful that we were able to get her out of the uh, tech the tech world where she was previously working for a self-driving car company called Cruise. And her email address is there at the lower left of your screen. Um, as well. So when you're interacting in the chat, you'll see her dropping links um, and she and I are going to be working together to try to present um, today's session. If you're not familiar with the News Literacy Project, we are a national nonpartisan nonprofit organization. We've been around for approaching 14 years. Our primary mission is about news literacy education in schools. Um, we develop resources, we develop education programs, professional learning, trying to support integrating news literacy across subject areas and grade levels. But in the last year to year and a half or so, we have been expanding that um, to try to think about the broader American education experience and how news literacy can be an important component of talking to adults and adult education and just generally um, making people aware of misinformation and the importance of journalism. Um, if you would like to follow us on social media, um, please feel free to give us a follow at Newslet Project on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. And if you use the hashtag News Literacy, we'll, we'll keep an eye out for it, and hopefully we can keep thing, keep the conversation going, and we can stay connected after today's session. One piece of technical issue for the webinar today: we are using Zoom webinar, which means unfortunately um, you will not be able to turn the camera on or unmute. Um, so there are two functions here, the chat, if you just want to send your own messages or make a comment um, uh, in the, you can use the chat function, you can send a message to everyone in the webinar or just uh, to Liz and me. Um, if you have a specific question about the content, about the examples or the concepts that I'm presenting, um, please use the Q&A function and we will be using that um, to be able to try to address questions as we go along. So I just want to do a quick refresher from the last session, just to make sure that we're all on the same page about what do we mean when we talk about misinformation? So in its broad, misinformation is a very broad term. And when you look it up in the dictionary, there are some words that are most commonly used to define misinformation. And this is the definition that we use in our education materials with educators. Um, and it's really important to understand that anything that is false or misleading, can be considered misinformation. And intent is really only important to talk about the type of misinformation that's being used and somewhat about the motivations. 
So misinformation is a very, very broad term, and it can include lots of different types of false or misleading information. One that's really important is the distinction between misinformation and disinformation. And this is something that I've noticed a lot of, a lot of people tend to conflate these two terms or use them interchangeably. But there's a very important distinction with disinformation. And that is, that is an intent. There is a very clear intent that disinformation is something that is false. It has been created knowing that it's false and it is being intentionally shared to deceive people into thinking that it is true. Uh, disinformation most commonly is we, when we refer to false information that comes out of government agencies, you know, government organizations, uh, political groups and such, where there is a deliberate intent to deceive people and they know they are trying to deceive people. Um, but generally, when we talk about false information, we use the broader term of misinformation. Um, and I want to use this example to kind of highlight this. I used this last time, so this will be familiar to some of you. Um, so this was a meme that went viral um, a few weeks ago on, on Facebook um, when I took this screenshot. It had been shared 78,000 times, almost 5,000 comments. But the thing is, is that this is two images that are put together to create a political statement. The top image um, is from Melbourne, Australia. It was taken um, in 2012. The bottom image was taken in South Carolina after uh, Hurricane Florence. And I want to use this example to sort of preview a couple of things we're going to be talking about. First, this actually helps us really understand disinformation, misinformation, and how the same piece of information can, can be both. So somebody created this image, this meme, and they selected these images specifically to, to make this political point. So this person, whoever created this, and we don't, we don't know for sure who created it, but someone created this knowing that the images were unrelated. And in doing that, and trying to make people believe that it has something to do with the current political situation, in that moment, it was disinformation. When people started to share it, and when people started to comment on it and, and all these things, it really became misinformation because some people believed that it was true, some people believed that it was relevant to the political discussion, some people um, were sharing it simply because they wanted to, to people to comment on it. So really broadly, that's what we talk about misinformation. And so it's really important to, to, to be very careful about the vocabulary because disinformation is a very clear definition. Um, and the thing is, false information can be shared for lots of different reasons. Some people think that it's real and they share it because it, it fits with what they believe and they're trying to make a point. Sometimes people suspect it may not be real, but they're sharing it anyway because they're hoping to get likes and comments and engagement. Um, with all of this, you know, we talked last time about the role of emotional manipulation, exploiting cognitive biases. Um, and that previous session, and then just thinking about this, it's really important for us to remember that we're all susceptible to misinformation. We can all be manipulated into believing something is true, which is why before we share something, before we act on a piece of information, we need to verify whether or not something is true. And that's gonna be the, the focus of today's session is how do we verify? So going back to this example, so how, how did we determine that this wasn't what it, what it was? How, how do we fact check it? So there's three skills that I'm gonna be talking about this afternoon. Um, we're gonna talk about observation skills. We're gonna talk about search strategies, like how, how do we use the internet to search for information? And then we're gonna talk about a, spe a specialized search called a reverse image search. So one of the first things, observation, is just by looking at this meme, by looking at this image, one of the questions that we have to ask ourselves in questioning this image, is there context? Is there evidence? Do we have any information that tells us that this is what it claims to be, right? Now remember that top image isn't even from the United States. It was taken in Melbourne, Australia. But so there's nothing in this image that would really tell us when it was taken, where it was taken, Likewise, in the bottom image, we have no context. So just, just by observation, by looking at the details and asking some questions, this calls into question the validity uh, of the meme itself, right? The second is what's called a reverse image search. Um, 
I'll demonstrate how to do reverse image search in a minute, but basically what a reverse, reverse image search does is it tries to match the pixel pattern of one image with the images in a search database. So we can use a reverse image search to try to find other versions of these images and try to see if we can find information that would verify when and where those images were taken. And then finally, we can also just open up a web browser and search for some details. Um, we're going we're gonna to do some deliberate internet searching. We're going to try to find context, additional sources. We're going to try to see if somebody has done a fact check on this image. Um, and we're going to try to verify this information for ourselves. One of the most important points that I want to emphasize before we go into demonstrating some of these skills is what's called click restraint. So click restraint is a term that comes from some of the research and some of the education resources developed by the Stanford History Education Group and their civic online reasoning curriculum. What click restraint simply means is don't just click on the first link that pops up in your search results. You know, we, we don't necessarily want to think that the first one is always going to be the most relevant or the most accurate. It's just the search engine's best guess. So before we click on, a, on the links, we need to look at the options, we need to see what what the results are looking at um, and try to remember that this is a deliberate process. You know, we want to be careful. We don't want to just click on whatever comes up randomly. We want to try to be deliberate and we want to try to make sure we're doing this properly. Um, so before we get into the fact checks, I see that there is a, there is a question. Um, so Joe Novak uh, asks, if we discover we posted misinformation on social media, what is the proper procedure to follow? Do we remove the post immediately? Uh, do we leave the post up with a correction and an apology? Um, you know, there's there, there are sort of two schools of thought with that. Um, and it kind of depends on where you post it. Um, if you post something, say, on Twitter, you can't go back and edit it. Um, and it's out there and it's been shared. Um, if you post something on Facebook, you can actually go back and edit it. Um, I think broadly, probably the best thing to do is if you shared something that turns out to not be true, I would delete it. Um, and then I would make a post following up and say, yeah, I, I fell for it. I got manipulated into believing it was true, but then I fact check it and it turns out it wasn't. And, um, you know, don't share it. Um, I think you know trying to slow the spread of misinformation um, is one of the best sort of methods to do that, right? Um, some some people will leave it up and then correct it, but you know I think it's probably best just to get rid of it. Um, okay, so what we're going to do now, we're going to I'm going to demonstrate some some of these fact checking skills, um, and I'm going to do that. Um, by actually, by actually doing some of these. Um, so I've got some, I have some examples that I have bookmarked um, and I'm going, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna, I'm gonna do these, these fact checks live and I'm gonna kind of narrate and describe what I'm doing and while I'm doing it. Um, so this is um, the first example. Um, this is actually one of my favorites that has uh, popped up um, in, in recent weeks, recent months. Um, this person has posted this image on his Facebook account, um, and you can see that it has gone quite viral, um, and it's got 67,000 shares so far, 30,000 comments, um, and he is, uh, so this is claiming to be Heinz Mayor in sauce. So what I'm going to ask is um, while you're looking at this image, um, let's apply some observation skills. So take a look at the images you see on the screen. And in the chat, um, go ahead and type out something that you notice in the image that suggests this may not be an authentic image. Um, right, so a couple of you right at the, right the top, at the top of the logo, you see it says Dr. Photograph. Um, and then a couple of people are noticing it on the shelf behind it, right? There's no other bottles um, behind the, on the shelf behind the bottle. 
Um, and then, yeah, the, sort of the color of the logo looks a little off. And um, so that's the thing. So just by observation, right? So one of the things that I might do here um, is to do, so I see where it says Dr. Photograph. So I'm gonna do, I'm gonna open up a new browser tab and I'm going to type in um, Dr. Photograph, all one word, because that's how it appears on the label. And I'm going to see what pops up. And then one of the first things that comes up here is it's an Instagram account for Dr. Photograph. And I open it up. And sure enough, it looks like, well, here's another example of what has Heinz Mayorio. Um, but it looks like this, this is an Instagram account that is focused on fake products. Uh, I don't see the actual uh, Mayorio, Mayorio account here. I'm going to scroll down a little bit more to sort of see. I see a lot of fake products. And it wants me to log in. Let's see. Well, I'm having some difficulty here with that, but if I were to scroll down, I would find that it was from Dr. Photograph. So this is not a real image. This is a Photoshop job. Um, but it was posted without the full context, right? So with some observation skills, I can do that, um, and I can and I can see what's happening there. Um, okay, let's go to another. Let's go to an, another example. Um, so here is a tweet um, where this person has posted this image, claiming that it is Olympus Mons on Mars. Uh, three times the size of Mount Everest by Hubble. Um, so one of the things that I might I might do with something like this also, right, is is to kind of scroll down and look at some of the comments, right? And here's a tweet that somebody responded to it saying, "If this is Hubble's closest view of Mars, how could the above picture be accurate?" And there's a link to it says HubbleSite.org. So that's one thing I can look at. But if I open it up, the image. Um, one of the things that I can also see is that in the lower right, there appears to be some text on the image itself. Um, so here's where I'm going to want to check out this image, and I'm going to do a reverse image search on this image. And so the, the, what I'm going to do, I'm going to put my cursor over the image, really anywhere on the image you can do this. And I'm going to right click my mouse, and this and there's this menu is going to pop up. And I'm looking for this where it says search Google for image. So I'm currently using Google Chrome, and Google is my default search engine. But this function works in all major browsers. So there, this works in Safari, this works in Microsoft Edge, works in, Microsoft, it works in Firefox. So by clicking on search Google for image, what it's going to do is it's going to take that image from Twitter. And it's going to show me these search results. So the thing is, is that um, the first thing that comes up is a Wikipedia page for Olympus Mons. Here is a, uh, a website for NASA. And then if I go down to, towards the bottom, I see this little section that says pages that include matching images. Um, so this one, it says Olympus Mons viewed from space from Imager. Um, Pinterest, I don't think Pinterest is going to be a very effective here, but I have several other versions of the matching image on Imager. So I'm going to go to this one. I'm going to see what I can find here. Sure enough, I go back, I double check. Yep, that's the same image. And so I found another version of it, and it's a little bit clearer. And I've noticed that I can see the text in the lower right a little bit better. And so I'm going to search. Uh, I'm going to search for that name. And let's see. It's, I'm going to search. Let's see. So it's keys, and then I'm going to search for that name. So that's the name that is on the image itself. And I find up. So I find this website says all that's interesting. And so I have a couple of things for this person. So one of the search results here says, says he's an animator. 
Um, and so I'm going to go to here. I'm going to take a look at this one, see what it says. His amazing Mars landscapes. And it says he's a Dutch, he's a, so it says he's a Dutch artist. Um, his surface, Mars surface renderings are filled with an amazing degree of realism. And so by scrolling down, I can see other examples. So I can go to another one. So I can go to this science photo library to see if this shows anything. Um, and I just see I just see a bunch of other things. But it seems like that it's not an authentic image of Mars, but it seems like it's some sort of digital creation. Um, so I'm pretty confident at this point that that's not a real photo of Mars. Um, it's a digital illustration. Uh, so I'm just going to pause here to sort of see uh, if there are some additional questions so far. Uh, so part of the thing to remember is that these skills kind of all work together. Um, you may not use all of them at the same time, um, but being able to, to sort of check things um, as you're looking at them is really important. Okay. So I'm going to close these. Um, all right, let's go to the, our next example. Um, this is another favorite of mine. Uh, somebody posts this, um, Steve Irwin taking a picture with Mr. Rogers, um, who's wearing a Bob Ross shirt while there is a rainbow in the background. Um, so this is from uh, March of this year, uh, almost 2,400 retweets, almost 300 quote tweets, almost 10,000 likes. Um, I'm going to reverse image search this one. Uh, so again, I'm going to put my cursor over the image. I'm going to right click. I'm going to search Google for image. And sure enough, the first, the first things that pop up are fact checks. Um, so let me talk about fact check sites for a second. Um, there are a lot of different organizations or groups out there that are doing fact checks in different ways. Some of them are affiliated with news organizations. Some of them are independent fact checkers, right? Um, so I'm gonna show you a couple of things that I'm gonna look for to know whether or not I can trust uh, a fact check. So I'm gonna to go to Snopes to see what they say about this image. Um, so, we've got the, so we've got this, it says, is this a pic? Um, so right off the bat, they're telling me that it's not true. So one of the things I want to look for is I want them to show me their work. How do they know that this is not a real image? So they're, they're saying the claim is false. They're giving me the origin of it, um, that, that, this, that this was um, posted to social media. Uh, they're giving me some other examples of it. Um, and turns out, um, they found the original Mr. Rogers image from uh, David's tomato sauce. So they found the original version of the image of Mr. Rogers, and he's not wearing the Bob Ross t-shirt, and he's not posing with Steve Irwin. Um, and if we go further down, we find that they found the original version of the Steve Irwin image um, and so they're showing us the original versions and how those two images were photoshopped together. And so that's one of the most important things that we want to look for in a fact check is that they're not just telling us whether or not something is true or false. They're showing their work. They're telling us how they know and they're and, and we're able to evaluate it for ourselves. So if I go back to the, the search results, I can go to the fact check from USA Today. Um, also, so it came out right around the same time. And so they got the same thing. So we have, we have the claim. They're telling us about it. Um, it talks a little bit about how people responded to it. Um, and then they say, yes, it's a, it's a, it's a composite. And it's not authentic. Um, and they, they do the same thing. They tell us where, where the photos came from. So the, the first image from Mr. Rogers is from 2013, a Facebook post by David's tomato sauce. Same thing as from the Snopes one. We can see the original context. Um, and then they gave us, they don't, they don't actually show us the Steve Irwin. 
Oh, yep, they do here. So here, it was actually a picture of him posing in this model. Um, so that's the thing about fact checks, um, is that, yes, it's easy for them to show, tell us whether or not something is true, um, but they need to show their work. And so we don't just take them um, at their, um, uh, at, at their word. We, we want to make sure they, they show um, their work. So in this, in this, uh, Deborah Wills asks, which, which fact checks are the most reliable? Um, I, I don't really recommend any one over another because some of them will do different kinds of fact checks. Like Snopes, for example, does a lot of fact checks about sort of popular culture. They do some things that are political. They do a lot of things related to like myths and urban legends. Um, but there are some news organizations and, and fact checking organizations that focus on politics and current events. Um, so Washington Post fact checking, Reuters fact checking, USA Today, um, Associated Press has fact checking. Um, there's also PolitiFact um, and factcheck.org. They're all doing they're all doing great work in 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 their in their sort of areas of focus. But again. Even if it's coming from an organization that we generally consider to be reputable, we need to look at the individual fact checks and make sure that they're they're transparent. They're telling us how they know, where they got the context from, and how they made um, their um, determinations. Um, so Pat Egan asks, will people invest the time it takes to evaluate each message we receive? Realistically, people often read this info on the fly and will not have the time to verify each message. There are simply too many messages. That's very true. There's no way we could take the time to verify every piece of thing, every piece of information that comes across the screen. When it's most important is if you are going to share it or if you're going to act on it in some way, right? Before you share something, you should, you should verify that it's true, especially if you have a, especially if there's an inkling that it might not be true. Because that's the thing is when you share something, you're, you're putting your credibility on the line with what you're sharing. And if you share something that turns out to not be true, that, that kind of harms your credibility as, as a source of information for the, the people who follow you, the people you're connected to. Um, you, should, you should think about if, if you see a piece of information and you're using it in the context of a political decision or some social cause that you're behind, right? If it's some, some piece of information that you're going to act on in some way, you should verify it before you do that. And you're right, it's, it's not practical to verify everything, but I think it's something that we can get into the habit of doing to verify it before we share, especially if we don't, not, if we don't necessarily know where it came from. Um, are there electoral fact checkers? Yes, there's a number of organizations out there that are doing fact checking for elections and election related things. A lot of these organizations are doing it. Um, um, let's see. So Carolyn Bass asks, why would the Dutch artist do that, the Mars image? Well, that's the thing is it seems like um, for that artist, um, he one of the things he likes to do is to create illustrations of what Mars might look like. Um, and so some people do it because that's that's their passion for creating that type of artwork. Um, and so in creating that artwork, he's not creating misinformation. When people take it out of context and they share it and, and they try to share it. So remember that original claim, it wasn't from a Dutch artist. The original claim was that that image was from the Hubble Space Telescope. And it turns out that just wasn't true. Um, See, um, so uh, so Susan asks, um, what type of misinformation is this? So the Mr. Rogers example is manipulated um, because they took two images and they put them together as a composite, but they also manipulated the the T-shirt that Mr. Rogers was wearing. So there's actually two different types of manipulation. So the, so the Mr. Rogers um, example is manipulated content. The, the, the image of Mars um, is, we can sort of look at it two ways. One, 
so if I go back to if I go back to the the Mars example. So in this in this example, this is actually false context um, because it's not taken from uh, the Hubble. It's not taken from the Hubble Space Telescope as it claims. It's actually a digital creation from a digital artist. So in this context, we would we, in this we would call this false context misinformation. Now, if the if the artist had created this um, and then put it out saying, "Look at this amazing image from Hubble." It would be um, fault. It would. It could. We could consider it fabricated content. Um, so somebody posted, um, "How do you suggest responding to people that will say that the fact-checking organizations belong to a specific political party?" So there is there there is a level of criticism that people can level at fact-checking organizations. Um, because based on the content of their fact checks, it can appear that they are overwhelmingly fact checking one particular political party over another. Um, what I would sort of push back is and saying is like, what makes you think that they are part of a specific political party? Because when I look at this fact check, I see a something that is false. And based on what I see from this fact check, this is this is how it's false and why it's false, right? They're they're not criticizing a politician or political party. They're just simply reporting and saying that this piece of information that we put out was false. Um, you know, it, that kind of gets to the idea of, of active listening and, and and questioning. Is is like what makes you think that it's that they're that it's political? Um, because that's this is this is part of what we're going to be talking about in two weeks. Is like how do we have these conversations? Is to sort of ask that question and then say, here's what here's what I see when I look at this example. Tell me what you see and look at things together, and you would be able to um, to do that. Okay, um, let's go to another example. So this one's going to be a little bit more complicated. Um, let's see what time it is. Okay. Uh, so I'm going to go to um, another example. Um, so here is a tweet. It's actually a few years old, um, but I, this is one of those that has popped up every once in a while. Um, this is claiming to be women firefighters who are dousing flames during the Pearl Harbor attack on December 7th, 1941. Um, so just by looking at the image, right, um, we have the caption. We, we can see, yes, it is women uh, who appear to be fighting, using some sort of firefighting hose. Um, they are next to water, so it could potentially be the Pearl Harbor Navy base. We don't, there's nothing in the background that helps us understand that. It's a black and white photo, but that doesn't necessarily mean it's from 1941. Um, so I'm gonna do a reverse image search on this one. Now, again, just like this a previous example, the first two things that pop up are, so this is trying to, so the suggestion is Pearl Harbor. I have the Wikipedia page for Pearl Harbor. I have a Pearl Harbor fact sheet fact sheet from, from the census. Um, neither of those seem relevant to what I'm looking for, but I can see here where it says visually similar images. So I'm going to click on that because this is going to show me what, what um, Google thinks is the closest. So I look in the upper left here, I see it's the same image. But one thing that I noticed by clicking on it and I see this preview is it's actually missing that life watermark that was present in this other image. So here in this version, it has life in the lower left of the corner. But I go here. So now this is like, so this is the images from gender and the sea uh, on blogger.com. I don't necessarily know that that's the most reliable, but I see it says three lions and Getty images. And then I notice here under related images, here is the same image and it's, it's from Getty images. So I'm going to go to Getty Images, 
and I'm going to visit and we'll see what I can find. So this is from Getty Images, and this is things related to Pearl Harbor. I'm going to scroll down, and there it is. So this is the original version of it from Getty Images, and it turns out this said, the caption says women firefighters during a training exercise at the Pearl Harbor Naval Shipyard during World War II, circa 1941, and then it tells us the names. And again, this is it says Getty Images Three Lions. So it's partially true. Um, so the image is actually women training to be firefighters at Pearl Harbor, um, but it wasn't during the Pearl Harbor attack as the claim was. Um, but that's an important thing to think about is, is how do we look for um, you know, the most reliable sources. Um, okay, we're gonna do one more example and then we'll do some questions and then we'll share some additional resources with you. So I'm gonna show you one more. Um, so this, this uh, image went viral a while back. So this is originally from March. I've seen different versions of it over the last couple of months. So this is claiming to be from the Betty Comic High School in 2021. And um, obviously this is talking about kids never having to go to school, uh, doing um, uh, schoolwork at home. And so um, we don't know exactly when this is from, but um, I'm kind of curious, is, is this, this seems to be a little too on point. Um, how could Betty have really predicted that? So I'm gonna open up a new tab and I'm gonna just type in Betty in high school 2021. I'm going to do a search. Um, I see that there is a fact check from Snopes. I have a, a link from Archie Comics um, that looks like it could be helpful. There's a bunch of other sources here. Uh, so I'm going to click on this. Um, did it actually come? Did this actually happen? Turns out this one is true. So they actually published this in 1997 about Betty attending virtual school in the year 2021. So Archie Comics um, accurately seems to have predicted the, um, the, the, the ex explosion of remote learning that we, we kind of gone through in the last little bit. So that one actually turned out to be true. Uh, okay, I'm gonna go back to the Q&A and look at a couple things. Um, so James Berry asks, on the Mars image, is the by Hubble a link? Uh, nope, that is not a link. That is just that is just text in, in there. Um, if that had been a link, that would have been something important to click on. Um, so Linda Williams asks, why should fact checking be our responsibility after it's spread, it should be stopped at the source after they check? Uh, don't we agree? Um, so Mike Webb, who's my colleague here at the News Office Project, he is part of our communications team. He's going to type an answer to that. Um, and I'm going to let him, I'm going to let him type that answer and then I'll, then I'll add mine. Um, when we get done with that. So there's an answer coming to that one, um, Linda. Um, so Summer Doucette asks, uh, it seems to, to me that many people are skeptical of social media posts, even acknowledging it as they post misinformation. The more serious problem uh, seems to me that so many people are lumping all quote media together and saying it's all trustworthy. I have, I have students with no trust in news organizations and they're reporting. All I can do is continue to show them how journalists fact check and why they might get it wrong and especially how they read more resources. We'll be discussing this. So I, I'll answer that um, by saying this is, this is one of the biggest challenges that we're, we're trying to confront is the difference between um, being skeptical and being cynical. Um, there is a great deal of cynicism out there um, when people talk about the media, right? Um, and, and this idea that somehow all news organizations are coordinating and collaborating to, to spread information on this information. Um, 
the objective in, in education context of news literacy and, and these skills that we're working on teaching is to try to edge away from cynicism and into skepticism so that we, we have an idea of when we can trust something and when we need to verify something for ourselves. Because one of the things that we would obviously want to, to get to is that we would recognize when something comes from a reputable organization that we may not need to go through these steps to verify for ourselves because a reputable organization, when they share something, they share something that they have verified to be true and they tell us how they know what their sources are. The big problem is how misinformation comes from a lot of different sources. And there's a difference between the person who creates this, this, this information and then the people who share it, because that's actually one of the biggest realities is that most false information doesn't, it's not, we're not seeing it from the sources, we're seeing it from other people. Um, and, you know, when we talk about like pandemic related misinformation and vaccine misinformation, we know that there are some groups out there that are actively trying to spread false information about vaccine safety, vaccine efficacy. You know, we're seeing a huge explosion of it, like right now, um, especially since you know parents all around the country are um, are looking for vaccine appointments for their children who are between ages of five and eleven. Um, my son actually has an appointment for his vaccine tomorrow afternoon after school, and he's very excited to to finally be able to get vaccinated. Um, and but but there's a lot of people who are who are actively trying to spread that false information. Some of them are spreading it because they're trying to uh, make political points. Some people are spreading it because they're trying to um, um, they're trying to it's something they believe to be true, um, and they're trying to, to share their ideas. Um, um, but that's the thing. It's like we need to we need to be very careful about what we're sharing and and how we how and when we check information. And that's the thing is when we talk about young people in particular, especially middle school students, and I know this from, from my own experience, they tend to be very cynical of the world. And we need to try to get them towards um, skepticism. Um, so Janine Novick as the Pearl Harbor one would be a real photo with an inaccurate caption. Correct. Um, so it is it is a real photo. Um, those are it was it is actually women um, who are uh, they were training to be firefighters, but it was not during the Pearl Harbor attack. Um, so uh, somebody posted here, I'm seeing a meme posted a lot lately with a recent quote by Glenn Greenwald saying fact checks are fraud. And then the fact checking industry is designed to disguise liberal media activism. I'm stumped about how to deal with that mentality. Do you have any insight about how best to prove the validity of a fact-checking organization and to defend the practice in general? So I'm not going to get into Mr. Greenwald and his positions on that, but one of the challenges that we are dealing with is the people who are engaging in confirmation bias. Um, if they see something that aligns with their beliefs, they are likely to accept it, whether or not it's true. And if you and if there's a fact check that that calls that belief into question, then confirmation bias is also going to lead them to just dismiss it. And so this is this is one of the biggest challenges is that people don't like the idea that what they believe may not be true, and they may see these fact checks as being kind of an assault on their beliefs. Um, and also when we when we sort of talk about the context of um, you know, saying that this is this is you know the fact checking industry and it's there they're trying to push a particular you know political bias. That's also that's an example of institutional cynicism. Uh, this is the idea that there's you know and it's, and it's part of we could even say it's edging into conspiracy theory territory in the sense that people believe that these fact checking organizations are somehow trying to manufacture this false information, um, and and that's the thing is is when we're talking about belief, it's very difficult for a lot of people to sort of deal with the idea that what they believe may not be true. Um, and this is something we'll talk about in two weeks with our last session, um, where we, we need to, there are some strategies that we can use. So the, the next session is gonna talk about how do we talk to people who believe it. Um, 
So Philip Daniels asks, uh, many people use iPhones to browse social media as opposed to PCs. How does one execute fact checking using, using an iPhone? So there are apps that you can download. If you go into the iTunes app store or the Google Play store, um, you can look for, if you just search for reverse image search, um, there are apps that will, that will help you do reverse image searches on your phone. I don't have anything that shows that here in this, in this session, um, but you can take a screenshot of an image on your phone or you can save it to your phone and the app will help you search it. So there are apps out there um, that will do that. Um, there's a question here. Do you have tips for fact checking TikToks or messaging apps like WhatsApp slash WeChat? Um, so obviously you can't reverse image search a video. Um, that technology hasn't really been developed yet. And that's where some deliberate search strategies are gonna be important, right? That's where you would sort of take some details from the video or take some details from a message, plug it into a browser and start searching for some details. And that's where it's really where the power of the internet search becomes most important. Um, okay, I'm going to go back into my slides and I'm gonna share some resources with you. Um, and then I will leave some, some time um, to answer some additional questions as we start to wrap up. Um, so one of the most important things that I emphasize, in particular when I talk to educators, but this, this applies to everyone, one of the most important education strategies, education tools is and always will be modeling. We need to model these things for everyone else. So we want you to help us in, in, this, in this effort to stand up for facts. Before you share something, make sure that it's make sure that it's accurate and true. Make sure you know the source that it came from. Um, help help spread verified information. And when possible, if, if you see somebody has, has posted something that's not true, try to, to share information to, to debunk it and push back. So we will talk a little bit about debunking strategies next week, um, as well as these what we call productive conversations about confrontation. So this is in two weeks on November 17th at two o'clock Eastern. Um, there is a link here to where if you are not registered for that session, you can register for it. Um, we're going to do some role play uh, with a couple of my colleagues, and we're going to demonstrate some strategies that you can practice um, to try to talk to people who are holding on to false belief, who are insisting something is true when it's not, um, and how to hopefully have a productive conversation in a way that can lead to a better understanding and hopefully maybe even bring somebody around to realizing their beliefs are not, are not true. One resource that um, I definitely want to share with you, um, we have this, it's on our website, it's called Eight Tips to Google Like a Pro. So I showed you a couple of very simple search strategies, um, but there are some other things that you can use if you're going to use a search engine. Um, so if you're a librarian, I hope there are some librarians on board, um, these are going to be very familiar to a lot of you, especially also if you're a researcher. Um, these, are th these are things that, um, we've been using for a long time, but there are some things that you can do. Um, you can search, um, limiting your search to, to news, right? You can put things in quotation marks to search for an exact phrase. Um, you can use a minus sign to exclude a, a word or a phrase from search engines. So um, this is available on our website at newslet.org. We worked with Cindy Otis. She's a former CIA analyst and she wrote an amazing book called True or False, a CIA analyst guide to spotting fake news. Uh, we've been working with her on some other things. So um, this these ha this has some really great strategies that you can use uh, for doing some deliberate internet searching. Um, on our website, newslet.org um, slash four dash everyone, we have a number of other resources that relate to news literacy more broadly. Um, I, we have a section that has, has a, these types of strategies and more. If you want to go deeper into news literacy learning, you can sign up for some, some of our e-learning classes on, Ch on the Chuckology Virtual Classroom. Um, so go to our newslet.org and you can find those resources there. Um, if you'd like to, to sort of know more about what's going on, we have several newsletters that go out each week. One that I would really recommend is called Get Smart About News. Um, this comes out every Tuesday. Uh, my colleagues on the education team, as well as our 
uh, our friends on our communications team put this out each week. Um, this is, you know, things that are happening that are current trends in misinformation, news literacy, journalism. If you are an educator or you know an educator, the SIFT goes out on Mondays. Um, it's a newsletter specifically for teachers and with things related to news literacy um, activities and things that they can do in the classroom. And then if you just want to know what we're up to with the News Literacy Project and all the things that we have going on, you can sign up for NLP Connections. It comes out every quarter. Um, and you can see all the amazing work, as not just not just the, us and the education team, we have people across the organization who are doing really cool things. So if you go to newslit.org slash subscribe, you can subscribe to one or more of our newsletters. Um, if you are into podcasts, uh, please consider subscribing to Is That a Fact? Um, this is our podcast. We're in season two. Um, this podcast is geared towards adults and the general public talking about news literacy and misinformation and journalism. We have issues on conspiracy theories. We do a special uh, edition of, with the recent anniversary of the September 11th terrorist attacks. Um, you can go to all the major podcasting platforms to find it, or you can go to newslet.org slash podcast. Um, our, my amazing colleague, Daryl Warland, um, is the host of that, and she does, an, she does a great job with that. So um, is that a fact? Uh, we have an app that you can download onto your phone. Um, it's called Informable. Um, this is a brain training style app. Uh, it is uh, free and it is also advertising free um, where you can learn and practice some basic um, uh, news literacy skills. Um, and then the last thing, um, our primary mission, the thing that we do most of our work on is for classrooms and working with educators. If you are an educator or you know an educator, uh, if you're connected in some way to somebody who's working in the classroom, we would really love to be in touch and work with them. We have a number of resources that are specifically for how to teach this, um, what to do, how to do it in the classroom. So we would love if you could help us get in touch and reach out to, to be able to help the next generation um, be more news literate and less likely to fall for this information. Um, so we're going to drop a link in the chat here for a feedback survey. Um, it's a short, it's a short survey. We would love to hear your feedback. We'd love to see how how well we did with this session. Um, and I'm going to go back into to see if there's some additional questions that I can try to get to. Um, let's see. Um, so Joe asked when the video of this presentation will be available. Um, as soon as we're done with today's session, as soon as we're done with recording, um, we will we will download the video. We will make sure it's clean and ready to go, and we will put it up on our YouTube channel. And um, we will make sure that we get those um, get the recording out to you. Um, Susan asks uh, the link to the examples. Um, can we put the links in the chat so we can save them? So uh, Liz, um, if you could. Um, copy from the, the Google Doc with the links. I think I gave those to you. We can um, send those links so you can take um, a look at those. Um, Michelle Boulon asks, why do you think so many people are sharing incorrect information? Um, you know, this gets to the heart of why misinformation is a problem, is that the combination of emotional manipulation in particular, but also manipulating cognitive biases and confirmation bias is really driving a lot of why people are sharing, sharing false information because they see something and they react and they believe that it's true, especially because it agrees with them. Um, and why is this a problem? Um, I think there's a, there's a number of things that are happening in particular, but you know, when I see a lot of the trends that are happening, um, people have become so entrenched in their political or social beliefs. I think that a lot of people just, we've gotten to a point where we're not willing to be wrong in a lot of ways. But I think it's also part of a bigger issue in, in terms of the fact that we've, we've lost the ability to have discourse. We've lost really the ability to have an exchange of ideas 
in the sense that I'm going to tell you what I think, you tell me what you think, I will listen, you will listen, we'll share ideas, and we might change our position on things. So much of what we see is more about debate in the sense that I want to be right and I want to prove you wrong. And, you know, we've created these bright lines on so many of these issues and we're losing the gray areas in a lot of ways. And I think it's, it's, a, it's, it's really problematic, but, you know, I think we're seeing, we are seeing some progress being made on some of those fronts. Um, more people are, are aware of false information and are pushing back on it. But the thing is, is that, you know, when people become deeply entrenched in their political and social beliefs, um, they just want to hold on to it as tightly as they can. And it's, um, it's difficult. Um, somebody asks, is anyone working on being able to fact check videos? Yes, uh, I know that there are some organizations out there that are, that are developing some tools. There are some tools that are available if you have the right software. Um, um, one of the ways that, that uh, people can do that is, is they can take a, a still, they can take a screenshot of one part of the video and reverse image search that. Um, it's becoming more and more important because of deep fakes and video manipulation. I imagine we will see some some easier to use tools coming out in in the next um, uh, next few years. Um, let's see. Oh, I don't know. So Jamie asked. One of the person said, "Stop using the Bitly URL shortener. Ly is the top level domain in Libya. They will not click on my survey link." Can I debunk that person's claim? I don't have time to debunk that. Um, I, that's actually something that's new to me. I'm not, I have not heard that before. Bitly is a, it's a URL shortener. So basically it takes a really long web link and it creates a short version, which redirects to the original one. That Bitly link that we shared goes to a Google Forms. Uh, it's a survey on Google Forms. It's actually on my personal Google account. Um, so I can, I can, I can attest and take my word for it, that it's, it is a safe link. Um, we, we can look into that. Uh, that's not something I heard before, but I, we will look into that and we will see if there is an alternative, um, that we might be able to use. Um, okay. Let's see. Um, okay, so that is, we are coming right up at the end here. Um, we only have about two minutes left. Um, so I just want to thank everyone for taking the time uh, to, to learn some fact checking skills with us. Um, we will make a, the video recording available in the next day or so. Um, please consider uh, joining us in two weeks for the last session of our series. It's coming up, it's coming up on uh, November 17th. Um, I would also just one, one more time like to, to acknowledge our gratitude towards the Four River Foundation for helping to support our work in doing this and our partnership with Senior Planet and AARP. Um, and also on behalf of the News of Russia Project, thank you for your time. Um, we really appreciate you being willing to do this, um, trying to learn these new strategies. Um, and hopefully you can be part of this work and help us, uh, especially to create a future founded on facts. So thank you very much for joining us. I hope you enjoy uh, the rest of your day.